So uh, let me thank first uh, the organizers of this colloquium for inviting me. It's uh, I'm very happy to be back here in, at Fields after the pandemic. So this, it's very nice for me to be here in Toronto. So what I'm going to talk about today, it's, um, it's a collection of results that uh, they started back when I was in Colorado in 2018. And uh, so far, we have two papers, possibly a third one coming up soon. And it's a joint work with uh, different subgroups of this, of this list. So it's a work with Tamara Grava from CIS and Bristol, and Bob Jenkins in Florida, Ken McLaughlin, who, is, uh, who just recently moved to Tulane uh, in New Orleans, and Alexander Minakov from Prague. And uh, so my, okay, the, the, the topic of, of today, I'm, I'm actually gonna jump back and forth between two integrable models. So one is the very well-known court of the Vries, the Vries equation. And we all know about this picture where they're recreating this, uh, this solitary wave in the Union Canal in, in Edinburgh, uh, which is a single bump that just propagates and it, it maintains the shape and the velocity for a long time. Well, the theory tells us forever. And then I'm also going to switch and well, KDV equation is very well known. It appears in for, for shallow water waves, but also uh, acoustic waves in plasma, acoustic waves on crystal lattice, uh, internal waves in the ocean and many other, many other models. And then I'm also going to uh, switch temporarily, especially in the middle part of my talk. Uh, and I'm going to talk about modified KDV. So you can see that it looks like KDV is just as a, as a square here. And that also it's been introduced much more recently in the 60s. Uh, and that also has uh, applications in physics. So electric circuits, again, plasmas and so on. So we all know that uh, both of these models are examples, very famous examples of integrable PDEs. And by integrable, it means that they have a lax pair. So they have two operators. The L is usually, as you can see there, the, the Schrodinger operator. And the B is the other operator that sort of dictates how the solution should evolve. And their compatibility condition, which is written over there, so the, the time derivative of the L operator is equal to the commutator between the two operators. Well, this is equivalent, solving this, this compatibility condition is equivalent of finding a solution for uh, either KDV or, or MKDV. And this is just one example of one solution for MKDV with two solitons. Okay, and you can see already here, so there are these two bumps, one goes through the others. And uh, I like to, to do this little demonstration. So what happens? So their height and their velocity does not change, but there is one thing that changes, which is the phase shift. So here I'm putting my cursor there and you can see that after the solitons has passed, the peak has shifted a little bit. And this is gonna be a fundamental intuition that we're gonna exploit to actually study soliton gases, which is our next it's step. The, the, the moving eye also experiences a, a delay or an advance? Sorry? Does the moving eye also get delayed or advanced in the same way? The big one, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They both get a shift, yeah. yeah. And it's, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say more about that. But yeah, they both get some sort of, it's an elastic interaction, but then they get this shift. And so, standard solutions, you can just make these answers of a traveling wave, and uh, either you impose decaying initial conditions, sorry, decaying condition at the boundary, which is at plus and minus infinity. Then what you get is the bump, the soliton. This is the soliton for the MKDV. So you can recognize here you have a hyperbolic secant. For KDV, you have hyperbolic secant squares, but they're similar. And the main parameters here in the, in the game are this kappa uh, and the kappa naught. So but kappa naught is just initial position, but then the kappa is what is very important that tells us both the velocity of the soliton and the height. So height solitons travel faster, and they all travel in one direction towards the right. And then if you impose periodic boundary conditions, well, then you have the periodic traveling wave or conoidal solution uh, and this looks like this uh, Jacobi elliptic function, this dn function with a certain parameter again, which is a velocity, uh, another rescaling there, the, the, the height, and then a modulus. It goes between zero and one. But this time when it's velocity, it seems like there's more parameters. Like... Yeah, no, they're all interrelated. So also in this case, uh, the v1 and the a are connected. So the a1 is gonna, it's gonna be clear in our solution where you're gonna see again, this sort of kappa value that appears everywhere. So, so how do you find general solution? Well, the idea is that, okay, you have your initial condition Q of X naught, and you wanna go from Q of X naught to Q of X it, to the evolved solution. And uh, what you do, you kind of, you calculate your lax pair at initial condition. So you calculate what they're called the scattering data, which are the L2 eigenvalues of the Schrodinger, Schrodinger operator, the norming constant, the reflection coefficients. It is just standard practice uh, in, in the realm of scattering theory. And so, so you shift your problem into this, what I call happy uranium. So in this uh, scattering world, 
you evolve them and the evolution is actually very simple. It's actually linear. So you can think of the scattering transform as some sort of non-linear uh, Fourier transform when you want to solve PDEs. Uh, and once you know the evolved scattering data, you get back. You get back to your, to your solution Q of XT. And the way you get back is originally, well, the classical ways you solve this Marchenko integral equation and modern approaches, you use the Riemann-Hilbert problem. And I'm, I'm going to tell you what is the Riemann-Hilbert problem. What's the wording? Hyper RH? Hyper uranium. Ah, hyper uranium. Oh, okay. So this is this is just a reference to my background as an Italian or as classical education. So this is this is the word of ideas that Plato was suggesting. So there is a real word that is a lot of lies, and then there is the truth that lies in the hyper uranium. <laughs> so what is a soliton gas? So solitons are this bump. Uh, what is a soliton gas? So let's just give a very informal definition first. It's just a collection of a lot of solitons. They can be random, they can be not random, they can be deterministic, but the idea is that you have a lot, num a big number of solitons, possibly an infinite number of them. And this is just some numerical simulations where the height of the soliton, or all of these little peaks are sampled, a uniform distribution between one and three. And this is the, the numerical simulation of the evolution of the, of the solution. And there are, this is just one uh, experiment from 2016, but there are many more. And these are, I think these are KDV solitons, but there were many more experiments also for NLS, K MKDV, and so other integrable models. Sorry, the right-hand picture, the lines you see are the, the waves you're smoothing? Yeah. Like yeah, 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 yeah. And here is not so clear, but they kind of interact pairwise, only pairwise. The, the... It's, uh, it's periodic, or it's uh, word bound. So here, here they set, uh, so here I think they have 200 solitons. It's, it's not written there, but I think they have 200 of these solitons and it's zero. But the idea is that they look at this small window. So I guess they impose zero boundary condition so in their numerical domain. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think these, these were some early works. I think uh, I'm, I'm not mentioning all the papers, but there were, there is a lot of, a lot of new papers where they actually study even with boundary conditions as far as I remember, especially so Gennady L and his group, they're really working hard on uh, numerical simulation and, and theoretical approach. So, so why soliton gases? Well, they also appear experimentally, so they can be created in, in a lab. So these are two uh, pictures. This is the, the, the slide from Pierre Suret. Pierre Suret's talk at, at, at INI this, this past October, where he was actually explaining that he, in his lab, he managed to create soliton gases, both in a tank, so water weights, or uh, in some other, uh, I, I'm not sure what, what that machinery is, but it creates some soliton gases in, in optics, in an optics scenario. And these are just some measurements that they, that they had. This is one of their papers. So definitely there is also an interest from the physical point of view that indeed like soliton gases can explain some physical phenomena. So, so here is getting back to just two solitons that interact. So now we have a bigger picture. So the first one on the, is just the first on the, on the left is just the two solitons, one passes through each other. The second one is, it looks like a line. It's just the position of one of the peaks and it looks like a straight line. There is actually a discontinuity. This is the velocity that has a jump and this is the acceleration. Okay, so the idea is exactly, is exactly the fact that there is this phase shift and it, and it is of this logarithmic uh, shape for both the big soliton and the small solitons. So, so this is the first intuition of how we construct a soliton gas. There is some, some shift that happens if there are two solitons. So of course, if there are many, there are gonna be more logarithmic interactions that just accumulates. And so indeed, the second intuition is that suppose that you have a lot of little Lilliputian over there, that's our gas, and you send a big soliton just passing through that. Already, well, this is numerics, but already in the intuition, the idea is that you accumulate so many phase shifts that, eventually, that effectively you are adding a velocity. So the, so the soliton gets accelerated. So this is the, this is how we can, let's say, break open. So the red one is the soliton that the, as it's passing through the gas. The black one is the soliton without the gas. So it's just a comparison that shows that indeed the, the black one evolves linearly, the, the, the red one has acceleration, yeah. Okay, so this was actually the original idea of Zakharov. So Zakharov already back in 71 was the one that actually started theorizing the idea of a soliton gas. And what he was, uh, his argument was that suppose that the gas is dilute, well, basically means that you can tell all the peaks apart, like in the previous pictures that I was showing you, then you send a large soliton that pass through that, and then the effective velocity of the soliton can be calculated in this form. So you have the four kappa squared, which is the, 
the, the, the velocity in the, of the soliton in the vacuum, if there is no gas. And then there are all these logarithmic shifts that they're accumulating. And the rows is, uh, is basically the density of the tiny solitons that are kicking the big soliton. And there is an extra uh, continuous equation that needs, to, that needs to be satisfied by, by the density of the gas. So fast forward into 2003, Gennady actually uh, generalized it to a dense soliton gas. So when you cannot see the peaks, they're not so, dis they're not so spread around on the whole real line. So if the gas is dense, then what you have is not really a formula to calculate the velocity, but it's an implicit equation to calculate the velocity of the gas, the soliton as it travels through the gas. So this was, this was originally uh, suggested for KDV in this paper by Gennady, but then uh, as you can see, again, the, there has been much more development for NLS in particular, especially this paper here generalizes to NLS and to other integrable models. Uh, this paper by Gennady and Alex. Yes. So, I mean, I'm just trying to understand the replacement of mean term. Yeah. So somehow is it that if I Taylor expand V of kappa in the dilute regime, then I get kappa squared? Is that yeah, the intuition is precisely that if... Uh, if you do some approximation, then first order approximation would be that one, indeed. They claim that they're rigorous. <laughs> I, I I am still working on their papers, but they have they have some some theory, especially in the no, the newest papers. Uh, especially this paper has been pretty fundamental, where they actually derive the whole the whole equations and they have some hypotheses and proofs. Uh, and uh, so it is rigorous. But is this is this approach of soliton gas that I am still learning about? So this is their approach, and we're going to have our approach in the next slides, and they do they do coincide, which is nice. But they are they are they are approaching the soliton gas from the point of view of kinetic theory. So indeed, it definitely starts from some physics uh, background that uh, it could be a little bit then wavy, but then they develop a mathematical theory. Okay. So in this, well, I, I know that here they were making some assumptions. So especially in the previous, in the original papers, but in 2003, I think they were making some assumptions that it was not clear whether they, this, these equations, for example, have solutions. So they were just deriving the equations. But for example, there is a, I haven't mentioned it here. There is a paper by Alex Tovis and Arno Koehlers when they actually proved that there are solutions. To these equations, for example, that's already rigorous. Yeah, there's already something rigorous. Rigorous is something that can be read by mathematicians. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like in this derivative, oh, we can they prove that if there's some regime in which you put a big solid on it and it actually goes to that speed? Uh, that's our paper. Um, in our paper, we show that our construction actually solves these equations. Yeah. And we and we prove more than that. Uh, I'm gonna get to that. So so this is the first approach for soliton gases. You just look at what's the interaction with a big soliton. The second approach is the, the, the intuitive approach. So like soliton gas is just a collection of a lot of a lot of solitons. There were already some results in the 80s uh, by Zeitzer and Witham and Boyd, where they show that if you just take a sum of uh, secant squared, then this basically is a, a coincides with the elliptic solution of KDV. And then this other paper in 92, they show that indeed like there exists a solution with infinite soliton for KDV, as long as you have some conditions on the norming constants and the- Hold on a second, that's on the whole line, the first one? Yes. What does it mean when you use this KDV coming from that? No, I think, I think it just coincides with the elliptic solution. So I don't, I'm not, also if you notice there, there is no T dependence. So I guess they just wanna show that that initial condition, that's a valid initial condition, but I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I haven't read those papers very carefully. I just wanted to, to mention that there, there has been some interest, uh, but there has been a huge interest in these past 10 years. And before there were just some sparse results. So, so what is a soliton gas? Let me give you like now a, a definition. So we came up with this, what is a natural definition, which is basically saying that soliton gas, it's a regular soliton gas is, is a solution of KDV or MKDV, as long as it can be written as a limit of infinite solitons. So you have an n soliton, pure, purely n soliton solution, no reflection coefficient, you take n to infinity, you find a soliton gas. And if you, if you look the interactive behavior of your solution with a soliton, then it satisfies the kinetic equation proposed by Zakharov and L. So this is our uh, working environment. So, so here are the results. 
So first we construct a soliton gas. And the idea is that we take n solitons, we take the limit, and what we're going to find is the solution, which can be written in terms of Fredon determinant. This is an exact expression, but of course, using like working with Fredon determinants is not uh, very convenient for certain for certain things. First of all, numerically, it's very hard to plot a Fredon determinant. And secondly, if we want to study long-time behavior, which is our, our main interest, then definitely studying Fredon determinants is not so straightforward. So that's when we're going to move on into the Riemann Hilbert uh, technology. And uh, so if we study long-time behavior, this is the, the profile of the soliton gas. And I will, I will say a little bit more about this, this profile. And then, then we will study what happens if we add that extra soliton that just interacts with the gas. It will turn out that the solution will actually split uh, linearly between a background soliton, sorry, a background wave, which is like, like a conoidal wave and then a soliton contribution, which does not really look like a secant, like a hyperbolic secant, except in certain regimes. Otherwise it's just a contribution from the soliton that just passes through the gas and then some error terms. And finally, these are the dynamic interactions. So we, we managed to prove that indeed this construction is an instance of a soliton gas. So it does satisfy the kinetic equations by Gennady. So, ooh, so I, I, should, I should rush because I really wanna get to the, to the last part. So this is the idea. So this is our Riemann-Hilbert problem. This is how you usually construct a solution for an n-soliton. For n-soliton, no reflection coefficient, you just have some poles in the upper half plane and some poles in the lower half plane. And let's assume that they are bounded between these two intervals, eta one, eta two, sorry, i eta one, i eta two, and minus i eta one, minus i eta two. That's your answer for the solution. And that's how you recover the, the solution of the KDV or MKDV. Here I'm focusing on MKDV just because it's a little bit simpler for the exposition. So it's a two by two matrix. Yeah. So, so the Riemann Hilbert technique tells you that suppose that you are on a complex plane, you have some poles, you want to find a function that is meromorphic everywhere except at these poles. And uh, then you make that answer and it's identity at infinity. So that's, so that's your answer. You have one, one on the diagonal and then you have some poles with some coefficients alpha and betas. And it's just a linear algebra calculations to impose these residue conditions so that you get you get your alpha and betas explicitly, and then you calculate this limit, you get solution of KDV, uh, and KDV in this case. For KDV, you have a vector solution, not a matrix. Sorry, and it's the, it's the off there. Right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, so basically it's the sum of the betas over there, yeah. And the sum of the alphas has a, has an exp, has a meaning, uh, basically is connected to the to Q of N squared. Okay, so, so we are here. Uh, it's just a matter of like some, again, linear algebra because now everything is fine at n. It's just a linear algebra trick that we can write it as a, as a logarithmic determinant of an n by n matrix. And this is still fine at n. And now the idea is that add more and more poles, always in this interval, rescale this norming constant chi appropriately and take the limit. And then what we find is a Friedman determinant. So of course it's not so obvious that a finite end determinant becomes a Friedman determinant, but this is the solution is exact and it's the Friedman determinant of an integral operator of that form. And the sigma one is just the interval, the bounded interval where all the poles are accumulating. So here, just an idea of the proof that the trick is that you realize that I alpha is a composition of two Hilbert-Schmidt operator and you just flip, it, flip them. And now you have a Friedman determinant, you can take the limit. And you, you... Fix these poles to stay away from the real axis, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the notion of convergence is uniform on convex axis. Correct, exactly. Yeah, that's precisely that's precisely that. And so so why do we like this expression very much? It's because, well, first of all, already tracing with in 96 derived a similar expression for the defocusing MKDV. So there is a minus in front of the nonlinearity. And then similar expressions were derived in uh, these past few years for studying the KPZ equations. So the weak noise solution of the KPZ equation. And then it was also studied by Thomas Wattner to study some class of Hankel's operators. So, so they're kind of ubiquitous, this type of kernels. So, so here we are, right? So we have, so we have the solution, we have the, the friend on determinant. We don't like the friend on determinant. So we would like to have a Riemann-Hilbert problem that we can work on. And uh, so what is a Riemann-Hilbert problem? Just to show you again. So we are in the complex plane. You have a bunch of contours that can be they're all oriented, so they all have an orientation. They can extend to plus infinity. They can be a loop. They can be poles, and that's and they have uh, some plus and minus direction. The idea is that you want to find a solution of this problem. So you want to find, in general, a matrix function 
that is meromorphic everywhere except on these jumps. And you have finite limit both on the left and on the right of the jumps of the, of the contours where the function is not defined. And the two limits are related according to a, a jump matrix, what we call a jump matrix. In general, it's extremely hard to find an exact solution. If you give me a random uh, contour on the, on the plane, I probably will not be able to give you a solution. The best that we can do is to find an approximate solution. So that's what we're going to use to study the solution of the soliton gas. So this is the, the riemann hilbert problem for the soliton gas. So instead of having a lot of poles in, in that band, we have a band. We have a full band, full interval, and those are the jumps. And these are, this is the standard evolution. This is the standard phase that appears in the evolution of the, of the KDD equation on the, on the level of the scattering data. So uh, just, a quick, uh, just a quick remark. So again, we can, we can reconstruct the solution by just solving the riemann hilbert problem and taking that limit. This is what Zakharov and Gennady, mostly Gennady, call a condensate soliton gas. So according to their theory, this is the densest soliton gas that we can obtain. And uh, so you cannot tell the peaks apart. It's smooth because we were sort of uh, rescaling the norming constants appropriately so that we would get something nice. And it's deterministic, so no randomness so far. We were prescribing the positions of the poles as we were taking n to infinity. And this is a little, a little extra. So this actually is an instance also of something that's called a primitive or Bargman potential where we have a, a jump matrix that is like that. It has this R2, this extra, uh, this extra, let's call it coefficient, this extra, mat this extra function that appears there. And uh, there, is still, there are still open problems. We're still working on that to kind of prove that also this, this new, completely new class of Riemann Hilbert actually describes a soliton gas, a certain type of soliton gas. Why not, if it's all deterministic, why don't you just say the initial condition is there in the middle? Well, we study the initial, so we're always living on the scattering data. Eventually, we study also the initial conditions, still with the Riemann Hilbert problem, still just asymptotically. Okay, so that's a hard problem. It's a hard problem. It's hard to go back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is the best that we can do, studying so, asymptotics. So you describe the relationship between the poles. Yeah. I mean, were they uniform or what? Were yeah, we, we assume them to be uniformly distributed. Yes. Because basically the underlying trick is just uh, you have a summation of all these poles, like in the in our ansatz. If you rescale them as one over n, you have a con you have con you have basically a convergence of the Riemann sums to the Riemann integral, right? So you have an integral, and then you eventually you do some tricks where you get. But so any distribution of poles such that the Riemann sum converges to the Riemann integral works. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's that's nice. And so, yeah, so this is what we got. So at time t equals zero, what we can do is we have our Riemann Hilbert problem. We cannot solve it exactly, but at least we can solve, we can check what happens at the boundary. So at minus infinity plus infinity, and it turns out that it's a step-like initial condition. So at, 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 on the left, at minus infinity, it goes to zero. On the right, it goes like a conoidal wave. And uh, what happens for t large? Well, this is the picture. So again, on the left, it goes to zero. On the right, it oscillates, and there is a, a middle region that is this modulating region that evolves in time and it's it's expanding in time and the whole the whole wave moves on the on the right right so so the, the parts where it's not trivial looks like like a conoidal wave again you can see this dn and you can see that what i was writing the a a1 and b they're all interconnected so they have i have this alpha plus at, uh, at a one also here and here it's a squared so they still depend on the, the scattering data so how do i do that how do we how do we get the the the, t, the, the long time behavior, well, the, the, the tricks are basically two. Once you have the Riemann Hilbert problem, you use either small norm theorem, which is the idea that if your jumps are basically the identity, then your solution is basically the identity. And the second one is that if your jump are not basically the identity, then you massage your problem so that you get to, the, to having jumps to be equal to the identity or almost the identity. Okay, so these are the two, the two big uh, methods that we're using, the two big theorems. So, so this is just, uh, just to give you like a very general definition. So very general idea the, you can see here the bands and uh, depending on the value of X over T in our, in our phase data, we, we are either in the case where we have the jumps that are almost the identity. So no contribution from this band, or if we move X and theta appropriately. So if we increase X over T, then we get, this is the case where no contribution. And then at some point there is going to be a little contribution that pops up from our bands. And that's where we're going to have this starting of the modulating region. And then eventually, and then eventually we recover the full band over here, full contribution from the jumps. And that's where we have the, 
technoidal wave at plus infinity on the right. So this is just how we managed to find this, this, this critical value here, the critical value where that moves along the jumps. This is just a little bit technical, so I'm not gonna, not gonna focus too much on that. And uh, this is our, this is our, this is our technique. The idea is that when you have contribution, what you have to do is again massage the problem. And by massages, we use something that is called the G function, that is very explicit. And you see here the logarithm term that is popping up. That sort of, uh, it's sort of a hint that the kinetic equation probably are gonna are gonna be satisfied. And once we once we do that, once we find the G function, then uh, we know how to solve the problem approximately. And so we can actually estimate this error very explicitly. It's not just a, it's just a, it's not just a guess. And we have a first order term, this, ex, this expression that I showed you in the picture before. So if I add the soliton, same thing. The only difference is that I have this Riemann-Hibbe problem with the two bands, and then I add two big, two poles up on top on the bottom. Why, why on top? Simply because this kappa naught is the height of the soliton. So I want it to be very, very tall and very fast so that it catches up with the gas and it passes through. So this is our Riemann-Hibbert problem. We do we use the same techniques. So the idea is that in the background, so the bands will still have these three behavior. So there will still be a, a quiescent region, a modulating region, and, a, and an oscillatory region that is fixed. And then the soliton is passing through it. And the fact that it's passing through it is going to create some shift, some phase shift. So here's what happens. So now the soliton is very far on the right. So there is actually Nothing, nothing really exciting happening, just the soliton is traveling linearly. But then if we start entering the, the modulating region, so there is a, there is a more, more contribution than we, need to, than we need to keep into account. Basically the idea is that we still have the modulating analytic region, but we have this S minus and S plus, depending whether the soliton has passed already or it hasn't passed yet. And uh, this is just some very technical construction on how we approximate our riemann hilbert problem. So we need to use uh, a Riemann surface of genus one that is constructed with that prescription, some Jacobi theta function, everything is fairly explicit, just very long formula. And this is what happens. The solid on enters and it's starting to interact. And very surprisingly, it's also, the height is also sh shrinking and, and expanding. So, Definitely the interaction is not trivial. So can we say more about this peak that is traveling through the gas? So the interaction is not Non-trivial. It's just, yeah. I, I will say I will say more something more precise about the non-triviality. So the first, so the first result that we have is that if we want to write explicitly the solution, at least for the large time, this looks like this is the sum of the background wave, which is this uh, dn that we've seen it also in the case of the free gas without a soliton. And then there is this contribution that we call it QSOL simply because it is still localized uh, in compact subsets, but, but it's very complicated. It involves all these theta three functions combined all together. Uh, on the other hand, we can, still, we can still recover the hyperbolic secant here if we assume kappa naught to be huge. So that's, that's why I call it giant turbo soliton because it's really tall, really big, really fast. Then, then it really looks like a hyperbolic secant the way we would expect from, from a soliton. Oh, and uh, we managed to calculate also the phase shift in the gas. So it's not only that the soliton gets accelerated and we're gonna get there, but also the gas gets shifted because the, the interaction is mutual. And uh, this is just a little, a little remark that um, in, our, in, our, in our theorem, the error term was awarded one over T. That was like a pessimistic estimate. So if we, if we impose more condition on this, uh, factor R that appears in the jump. And if we assume that vanishes like a square root or blows up like a square root at the end points of the bands, then actually we get better estimate. We get exponentially small estimate. Okay, and this is the general picture. So this is the, the yellow line is the soliton as it's traveling to the gas compared with the green dashed line, which is the free soliton without the gas. So we have a general description. You can see here that there's the modulating region over there in the middle. And this one is already, uh, just elliptic uh, conoidal wave on the, on the right. So velocity, so the last thing I wanna check is, okay, we, can we say more about the, the, can we look at the soliton a little bit more and track its behavior as it passes through the gas? Well, we need to use a bunch of uh, physics terminology. We're gonna define a lot of velocities. So this is the phase velocity, which is frequency over wave number. And uh, this is gonna give us the elliptic wave velocity, which is the velocity on the envelope of the gas. 
and it's calculated here, and the average soliton velocity, which you can think of it as the average soliton velocity as it travels through the gas. You, you've seen that it's highly oscillating. This is the average. And we they also define the group velocity, which is the velocity of the wave packet. So the first theorem is that indeed, we, rec we recover the kinetic equations, and those are satisfied both by the soliton, at least on average. It turns out that there are extra terms, highly oscillatory, that were not, uh, that kind of gets washed out if you, if you try to recover the, the, the kinetic equation by Gennady and, and Zakharov. And also, the, it turns out that even the gas satisfies the velocity of, of the group, the group velocity of the gas satisfies the same kinetic equations. And for the peak itself, we can actually track the peak up to order one over term, uh, up to error of order one over t. The position of the peak can be fairly explicitly calculated as an implicit uh, solution of this equation. And again, I, I just want, want to emphasize these are all explicit uh, quantities, just very, they do not fit in the slide. And the last thing is what about the velocity? So we know the position, so we can find that every time where the peak is and the velocity is even more important because then we, we recognize all the oscillations that we would see, where we, that we were seeing in the, in, the, in the movie. So this is the exact expression for the velocity of the peak as it travels through the gas. You can recognize the V naught, the V bar solved, the average, which is just the first two terms over there. And then we have this uh, derivative, logarithmic derivative of psi, which is this highly oscillatory extra terms that get, uh, that disappear when you average over one period. And this is the comparison. The, 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 the black line is the V bar naught, the V bar sol of kappa naught, and the blue is the oscillatory velocity of the peak. Okay, I am gonna skip the idea of the proof. It looks like it would be improving, but it's actually. Yeah, well, what, what do you mean? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the simulation, it looked like you didn't have a sense that this thing that was going down, these oscillations are. Block, yes, yeah. So I'm gonna skip the proof because I wanna I wanna get to the last part of my talk. So what are what what have we learned so far? So we've learned uh, how to construct a soliton gas. We've learned how the soliton gas interacts with a particle, the soliton, and the soliton gas is like a medium, and the particle is traveling through the through the medium. This gas is deterministic, but it solves these kinetic equations that were posed by Gennady and collaborators, where they consider some sort of randomness over there. But our, our gas is deterministic because we, press, we, we construct what they say, uh, one realization at every single step n, and then we take the limit. So what, where do we add randomness? Where, where can we add randomness? And so this is, a new, this is our new work with me and Ken McLaughlin, where we assume random initial data. So that's where we add our randomness. We don't put random initial data in the initial condition. We actually assume, we actually go back again to our Riemann Hilbert problem, and we're assuming that the, the poles over there are random. Okay, so I'm getting back to KDV. So this is, uh, that's why it's little m, it's not big M, it's just a vector with some prescribed conditions on the, at the poles. So these are all random, so what we have is a random Riemann Hilbert problem. Don't say random. What, what's random? what is random is this uh, the position. So the position, and okay, by, by, by this expression, then also the, the value of the residue. Sorry, what does this yeah, RMT mean? Yes, so RMT is going to be a random matrix theory. Okay. So we're going to. We're going to. So we're just trying to find some distribution. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for now, it's just D sum distribution. The randomness is the position of the of the poles, but then uh, as a byproduct, we're going to get that random. The randomness also translates into the the value of the norming constant. The chi j and uh, the, the then the rest. The height. Yes, okay. the height and the velocity. But this is not. This is just for illustration purposes, right? Yes. Because <laughs> it's periodic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I should have uh, ran a simulation for just. Uh, yeah, I apologize. This is uh, one very hand cherry picked realizations of uh, random solution. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, so what sort of distribution can we put here? Of course, we can put any distribution we like. The idea is that we want to use a uh, very, very classical and uh, foolproof tools from random matrix theory. So why did we thought about that? It's mostly because when we are in KDV, the poles tend to repel each other. So we don't have a double pole that collides. So then it makes sense to 
get back to something that is uh, like a determinant point process, a fermionic point process where points kind of repel each other. And the easy, the easiest, like the number one thing that you think, number number one example that you think of is this Laguerre Wishnot ensemble. So you have this, this absolute value of xi minus j to the beta. That's the term that is gonna push the, the points apart. And then this e to the minus, and then you have the summation, that's the potential that kind of keeps them uh, together. So they, it, it, it stops them from just running away to infinity. Okay, so this has a, there is a lot of uh, a lot of theory behind it, but what we really need to know is that let's assume that this the poles are distributed according to this distribution. There is a random matrix model just that lies behind it. These are the distribution of the eigenvalues of something of uh, the, the the sample matrices. So, so one of these one so we thought about Poisson. We also thought about uniform. That seems like the, the trivial thing. So the idea is that uh, so the the we can calculate a lot of things once we have a random matrix uh, model behind because we can evaluate, for example, how when you take n to infinity, you can calculate the macroscopic density. You have estimates on the like lower order terms, or you have estimates on well, you have uh, the, the microscopic behavior. You have Tracy Whedon on one side. You have sine kernel in the middle. So that was that's our first attempt. I, I'm sure that we can put other distributions. Uh, it's just that we are very familiar with this distribution. You want them to be some eigenvalues for movement. Sorry? You they don't. Eigenvalues for some movement. Yeah, 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 yeah. But in general, like our idea is that it, it has to be a determinant point process because then with that, you have a, an integral kernel attached to it. And then you can use again Riemann Hilbert techniques to, to study their behavior in the large N regime. So for example, it could be a beta model. It's true that, yeah, beta, beta ensembles, they're also related to random matrices in some sense, but it can be, yeah, it can be more general. Here I just, here I just mentioned beta equal one and two, that's when you have complex or real matrices, full matrices with uh, normal zero one entries. So, so we're assuming that, they, that, that our poles are distributed according to this specific distribution, but again, it can be, it can be generalized. And uh, so what happens when n goes to infinity, that's when we wanna get our soliton gas eventually. So the idea, so we know what happens for the, for the poles at, at least. And this is the, the, the marchenko pasteur distribution, right? It looks a little bit, it looks like this. This is for one specific parameter equal to gamma equals one half, uh, but gamma, if gamma is between zero and one, we get a, a macroscopic density that looks pretty much like this. It, it's compactly supported. It vanishes like a square root of the endpoints. You can calculate the endpoints explicitly. And this is actually the, the, the groundbreaking results from the 60s by Marchenko and Pasteur. And this is how the Marchenko Pasteur distribution looks like. Okay, so, so we have that. And this is our first result. So what we're proving is that actually the take the finite and purely solitonic solution with random solitons, random according to the random matrix theory distribution. Then what happens is that if you take n to infinity, then the solution converges in probability to our soliton gas, the one that we were studying before. This is uh, what I call Q0. And this is, this is a rendering of the soliton gas for KDV. So the previous, I was focusing previously on MKDV simply because the pictures were nicer and the, the analysis were a little bit simpler, but we can do the same for KDV. This is the expression for the KDV. So this is just 200 solitons and this is uh, soliton gas, so infinite solitons. So this is the first result, but then we want we want to know more. So then the same thing is when you started with uh Ferraro. With with well, you said it's the same soliton gas as before. Yeah, in the sense that uh so this solution converges in probability to the solution of the of the Riemann Hilbert problem with a full band. When you previously, so yes. Full band is the problem properly. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, make, make sense. So, so this is the first result, but then what we wanna know next is for example, can we do some law of large number type of results or some central limit theorem type of results? I'm trying to understand what the picture is then, because it doesn't look like the theory. Is this the picture? So this is KDV, before I was doing NKVDV, just because the exposition yeah. is nicer. So that's why it looks like all flipped out, all flipped upside down. And uh, also, yes, I apologize that the, these, these parameters here are a little bit different between this and this. But the idea is that if you, these are 200 solitons, that's how the solution looks like on, compact, on compactly supported uh, sets in X and T. 
and that should converge to something like this. So again, you have uh, on the on the left, you have the zero, so the quiescent region, you have the modulated region, and you have the cnoidal region there. Yeah. The cnoidal, the, the elliptic region on the on the right designed for, for KDV, just because of how we rescale the, the, the phases. Is, is this just because the eigenvalues for polyvalent so this basically work three hours? Uh, let me think. Yeah, probably it is because yeah, but th that's how we that's that's why we chose this distribution. Yeah, precisely because we want them to be kind of uh, yeah, uniform is not the right word, but yeah, indeed, like kind of spaced between each other. Yeah. So that's why I think that maybe for uniform is not going to be as simple, because then they can be very close to each other, and then we will we will need other techniques to study their. So earlier you switch your bands away from the real axis away yeah. from the. But when you do this random thing, yeah. So that was also something that we had to 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 look. So so in the limit, you have something is compactly supported away from zero. We had to estimate how close to zero you get. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Small tails and large large tail. We really had to estimate, have explicit estimates, so that we we yes. knew that yeah we weren't getting close to the dangerous zone. Yeah. So, so yeah, convergence in probability. The next step is, can we have a low of large number type of result? The answer is yes. So if we take the average of the n soliton solutions, the average converges to our soliton gas. And actually every moment, so here I just wrote the variance, the variance goes to zero, but every other, every higher moments, uh, find a number, find a number, like a moment of order k also vanishes. If we take the average square minus the square of the average that goes to zero. So in the limit, this n soliton, random n soliton converges to a deterministic uh, shape. So a deterministic profile. So you mean average over realization? Over realization, say so over realization of the, of the soliton, of the poles. And uh, any, any time, so this is done for compact, uh, compact subsets of, uh, of space and time. Yeah. So yeah, unfortunately we cannot, ex we, we did not yet extend it to the whole real line. That's gonna be that's one of the things that we want to work on. What happens if you have non-compact uh, subset of space and time? Uh, we didn't check the kinetic equations here. Yeah. Now here we were just wondering if uh, yeah if we could add randomness in the in the solution and what's the relation between our soliton gas and the random solution. Uh, Yes, so so this this law of large number is does not follow so easily from the convergence in probability. We had to do some estimate, and uh, what really helped us was the fact that uh, the n soliton solution of KDV never explodes. So if you have multiple solitons, the solution always remains bounded, and you have an explicit bound. This does not happen, for example, for NLS or MKDV. So so the implementation of our idea for other integrable systems would be would need some other techniques. But for KDV, it works really nicely. And uh, what about local fluctuations? That's the next step. So once we have low of large numbers, can we do CLT? And uh, well, we have a CLT results from the random matrix uh, side that tells us precisely that if you have a linear statistics, like the summation of F of lambda J, lambda J, think of your eigenvalues, then uh, in the limit, this con it converges to a Gaussian, a Gaussian that has zero, Zero mean and this very explicit, although very long, type of variation, variance. Sorry. So, so we want to use this result, and uh, the idea is that yeah, we have a linear statistics is this f that basically is what appears in the jump of our riemann hilbert problem, and uh, what, by just using the CLT theorem by Litova, Pastor, and Sherbina, we managed to recover some complex version of the CLT. This is on the level of riemann hilbert problem. Now the last question is: Can we go back to the solution of the KDV? And uh, this is this is this last piece of the puzzle, very important that we are still working on. This is our claim. So what we have, like our claim, is that indeed the the local fluctuation. So you take the n soliton solution, you subtract the soliton gas, multiply by n, then what you get is local fluctuation, which are Gaussian. This is just a, this is just one simulation that we have, one of the many simulations. And the Gaussian is given, it's a Gaussian field because it depends on X and T on space and time and is prescribed by this expression. So you need to integrate, you have this complex integral to integrate and this is gonna give you eventually a normal uh, real Gaussian 
area Gaussian with mean zero and possibly different variants. Well, possibly also the mean var varies depending on X and T. We, we haven't... Oh yeah, the gas, sorry, that's the, um, that's the jump of the solid on gas Riemann-Hilbert problem, conjugated with some matrices, but yes. So, so this is all deterministic and explicit, and that's, and that's the source of randomness, this psi that depends basically, it's a version of this linear statistics. It comes from there. Yeah, so, so far we, we found that. We still need to prove, we still, we are still missing some, some little parts in this proof. So that's why I cannot, I cannot write your is still a claim, but that's, uh, that, com that completes the picture, right? So then we have a lot of large numbers. We know that the finite 10 soliton converges to the soliton gas, and the next step, the local fluctuations are Gaussians, as we were sort of expecting. So, so the updated overlook is that even though our soliton gas was deterministic, you can think of it as a universal limit for uh, a large class of so and purely n soliton solutions with random initial data. And in this in this case, we just focus on some random matrix type of random initial data, but we're confident that it can be extended to other distributions. And future direction, as I was saying, clearly what happens in the non-asymptotic analysis, what happens for non-compact X and T, what happens for N very large, but still finite. So there should be some, some tails in the, in the far field that maybe something interesting happens. What happens if the solitons are bleeding out? Again, in this, uh, in this sort of fin finite, but large regime, one of, the, one of the applications, not really for KDV, but for NKDV and NLS would be certainly rock waves. There is some, some simulations by Perinovsky and Shurgalina where they show that actually this random interaction generates big peaks and the distribution of the height of the peaks gets changes in time. And so the, the high peaks becomes more and more possible more, uh, high pro with high probability. And then of course, other types of gases, what happens if you have two gases that interact with each other and uh, other, other geometry that you can plug into your riemann hilbert problem and then study. And with this, I'm on time. I just wanted to, to just wish you San Nicola, happy San Nicola. This is something that uh, I, I did my postdoc in Belgium and uh, this, is, uh, this is the traditional holiday where kids received cookies and gifts on this day. So I just wanted to wish you uh, happy holidays. Thank you. <laughs>